Welcome back to Chemistry 131A. Today we're going to talk about Model 1D quantum systems, in particular the particle in a box, as it's called. The box, what's the box? Well, to make things mathematically simple, when we were uh, normalizing the wave function and doing various things, we took the limits on integrals to be plus or minus infinity because it made the math easy. What it really did is it made certain terms go away to zero. And now we're going to do a similar thing. We're going to trap a particle inside a region of space by saying that the potential energy, if the particle gets outside this region, is going to go to plus infinity. And since a particle cannot have infinite energy, that traps the particle in the interior of the box. The reason why we do this is just, again, mathematical simplicity. This is the limit, to make it mathematically simple, of what could be quite a realistic thing where the energy gets high if a particle gets too far away from where it should be. So our condition on the potential energy, V of x, is this. It's zero if the particle's in the box, which we'll say is between x equals zero and x equals l and it's infinity otherwise if the particle is outside that region of the box. Uh, and as I said, the reason is just mathematical simplicity, and we will see that what that amounts to in this case is that the particle can't penetrate the edge of the box at all. Even though it's a wave, it cannot get in. So it's reflected off. Well, if Suppose we said, well, why is that? Why does the wave function have to vanish outside the box? The answer is we know that psi star psi tells us the probability that the particle's there. And if that's non-zero and we multiply by v equals infinity, we get an infinite energy. But if we specify the energy of the particle is not infinite, then we can't have any probability outside the box. The expectation value, in other words, of the energy would be far too big if we let even a little bit of the wave function slip outside the box. Uh, in addition to the wave function being zero outside the box, the wave function has to be zero right at the edges of the box. And the reason for that is that we want the wave function to be continuous, we want the wave function to be a well-defined function that we can take the derivative of and so forth. So we want it to be zero right at the edge of the box. And that's pretty much like a guitar string. If you put your finger on a fret, you're holding the string down there. You can pluck the string with different amounts of, of force to get different amounts of energy. And the other side is held and you get a certain standing wave pattern. And that's pretty much exactly what the wave function for the particle is going to be doing inside this spatial region. Um, so as I said, the continuity of psi is the reason why we ha can say it's zero at the edge. And that means that the kinds of functions that we can have have to have a zero at x equals zero and another zero at x equals l. But inside the box, there's nothing. There's no potential energy at all. Until the particle encounters the edge of the box, it pretty much thinks it's a free particle. And we already solved in a previous lecture what the wave function is for a free particle. And so what we can do is just piggyback on that and use those solutions. And then we have a couple of extra criteria to normalize the wave function and to make sure that it's zero at the edges of the box. Uh, inside the box, we have the time, dependent, time independent, excuse me, Schrodinger equation, which I've written here as minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi, and there's no v, so I've left that out, is equal to e psi. And that will give us the energy eigenfunctions for the wave function inside the box. We already know the general solution. It's a e to the i p x upon h bar plus b e to the minus i p x upon h bar. Uh, 
where p squared over 2m is the kinetic energy of the particle. But now we have two additional equations. We have that the value of psi, the probability amplitude at zero, the edge of the box, should be zero. And that is equal to a plus b, because e to the minus i zero is still e to the zero, and that's one. So that goes away. We just have a plus b is equal to zero. And then at the other edge of the box, psi at, at L is also equal to zero. And here we have the same kind of thing, but we have two additional things. We have e to the plus IPL upon h bar and e to the minus IPL upon h bar. Well, the first equation just means that a is equal to minus b, or b is equal to minus a, same thing. And that means that we can write the second equation as using a for both sides as a e to the IPL upon h bar minus a e to the minus IPL upon h bar. And so we have the two ex uh, exponential functions have to be equal. We don't want a to be zero or then everything is zero uh, and the wave function vanishes. And therefore there's a condition that these two counter-rotating things be adding up to zero at the edge of the box when x is equal to L. And what that condition is going to mean is that when these two corkscrews have to add up to zero, they can't just be pointing like that, they have to be pointing opposite each other. It's going to mean that uh, there's a restriction on the wavelength of the wave function. And that means that only certain energies are going to be allowed. A very useful relationship here is Euler's formula, which I've written out for you. e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. If you haven't had a course in complex analysis, you may not have encountered this kind of formula, but it is in fact by far one of the most useful relations you can ever imagine. And to, I'll just take a little aside here and show you how you can use this formula to derive all kinds of other formulas which some people try to commit to memory or they even write them on bits of paper and stick them on their desk so they won't forget them if they're doing a lot of trigonometric problems. So let's do a practice problem. Let's use the above relationship e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta to derive the double angle formula for the cosine and the sine functions. So if we have cos 2 theta, we want to express that in terms of cosine theta and sine theta. And if we have sine 2 theta, we want to express that in terms of cosine theta and sine theta. And uh, rather than memorizing some kind of formula that doesn't make much sense, we're just going to use the properties of the exponentials, which are very easy to remember, and do a little bit of algebra, which is quick. About all we have to remember is that i squared is equal to minus 1, and then we're in the clear. So here's the answer. Well, rather than memorizing the things, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set a relationship and say e to the 2i theta is equal to e to the i theta squared because that's how exponentials work when you have something in the exponent. And e to the i theta squared is e to the i theta times e to the i theta. On the left-hand side, then, we have cosine 2 theta plus i sine 2 theta, because that's e to the 2i theta, or e to the i 2 theta, if you like. On the right-hand side, where we have e to the i theta times e to the i theta, we have cosine plus i sine times cosine plus i sine. And if we work that out on the right-hand side, that's cosine squared theta plus 2i cosine theta sine theta plus i squared sine theta. And at this point, all we have to remember is that i squared is equal to minus 1. And therefore, we end up with cosine squared theta plus 2i sine theta cos theta minus sine squared theta.
So what? We have cosine 2 theta plus I sine 2 theta on one side, and we have this thing with three terms on the other side. Well, these are two complex numbers, and we're saying these two complex numbers are equal, and therefore the key thing is that that means the real parts are equal, and the imaginary parts are equal. Because the way we think of complex numbers is the real parts along x and the imaginary parts along y. And if the two numbers are equal, they have to have the same value of x and the same value of y. Well, the real part on the left-hand side is cosine 2 theta. The real part on the right-hand side is cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. That's the cosine double angle formula. The imaginary part on the left-hand side is sine 2 theta. The imaginary part on the right-hand side is 2 cos theta sine theta. And therefore, that is the relationship between the sine of 2 theta and uh, the sine and cosine of theta. And it's very quick and easy to do stuff like this. You don't have to remember anything. You can work out the triple angle formula. You can work out this and that and the other very easy and quickly. And it's much, much, much better than memorizing formulas that you don't quite fully understand. If you rely on your memory, you might get it wrong. And for sure, as you get older, you'll start making more and more mistakes. If you just rederive it every time, it's very easy to do and much more reliable. So let me just close by saying any trigonometric identity that you've seen can be derived by using these complex exponentials and just relating the real and imaginary part without any, any uh, particular other talent. OK, let's get back to our particle in a box. Now we know that the wave function vanishes at the, uh, left, at the right hand side of the box, big L. And we put in those numbers, and we had a e to the plus i p h i p l upon h bar minus a e to the minus i. And therefore, we just put in cosine plus i sine. And we get a times cosine uh, p l upon h bar plus i sine minus cosine plus i sine. And therefore, at the end, we get uh, 2i l, uh, excuse me, 2i a sine p l upon h bar. That's the condition um, that that thing equal to 0. a can't be 0. i is definitely not 0. It's the square root of minus 1. 2 is not 0, and therefore the sine function has to be 0. The sine function is 0 when the argument theta, which I've set to be equal to pl over h bar, is an integer multiple of pi. In math, we work in radians. We don't work in degrees. We always put things in, in radians, dimensionless. And the integer values that are allowed for theta are n equals 1, 2, 3, and so forth. And therefore, pl over h bar should be n times pi, where n is some positive integer. Again, we can't have n equals 0. If we have n equals 0, then the sine function vanishes everywhere. And that means the wave function vanishes. Um, Therefore, what we found here in this little bit of mathematics is that the condition that the particle be localized, that it be restricted to some region in space and not just allowed to just go wherever it wants, results right away in the result that the momentum and the energy of the particle are quantized. They can only occur in set amounts. Uh, we can take our result a step further now by doing the following. Uh, let's solve for this quantized momentum. Here's what we find. The momentum is equal to n pi h bar over L. And since h bar is h over 2 pi, then the momentum is just nh over 2L.
and that's just using the definition of h bar. That means the energy is quantized because the particle inside the box only has kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, and if the momentum's quantized, that means the energy is quantized, and the energy of the nth allowed state that can be occupied is n squared h squared over 8 ml squared, just by squaring the momentum and dividing it by 2 m. This is an important formula for a couple of reasons. First, it shows you how the quantization is occurring. Second, it shows you that the ladder of states is going up like the squares, not evenly, not getting closer and closer together. And what we'll find in the future, in a future lecture, is that that has to do a lot with the shape of the potential. So if we imagine that the potential is written as a power series, we could write v of x is equal to something times x squared. And then we could say it's uh, x to the fourth, or we could make it higher and higher. And if we made it x to the infinity, it would be zero when x is less than one, just say inside the box, and then it would suddenly blow up to infinity the second you got higher than that. And that fact that the power that of the potential is very high is the reason why these states get farther and farther apart. If the power is lower, they may be evenly spaced or they may get closer and closer together. Putting everything together now in what we've got, we've figured out that everything's quantized. We know the form of the wave function, and therefore we can write psi n of x is 2i capital A sine px upon h bar, and then we can express that in terms of our quantization condition using the quantized momentum n pi x over L. And so now h bar is out of it, and we just have this nice wave in the box. As the quantum number increases, the number of nodes in the wave is going to increase. And that is the condition that the energy increase, and that's, of course, exactly what we expect. But it's nice that it just comes out and that it makes perfect sense. Um, in fact, what we're going to find in the future is that the so-called nodes, the places where the wave function crosses zero, are ever so important because they give us a really strong clue as to what kind of behavior we're going to see. Where you have a node in the wave function, that means that the particle is never found there because psi is zero, so psi star psi is zero, and the particle is never found there. And in fact, if it crosses through zero, when you square it, it gets very small because it's small and negative on one side and small and positive on the other side. So it has to, the probability smoothly goes to zero. And that means, although the box is uniform, there are places in the box where we do not ever expect to find the particle if we try to measure its position. And that certainly seems different than any classical situation that we might think about where we have a ball inside a box and the ball could be anywhere in there. Of course, the quantum state of such a system has huge n and we could never see this kind of very subtle behavior because the de Broglie wavelength of the ball is far too short. Well, we still need to determine capital A. B went away because it was related to A, and the only way we can determine A is by normalizing the wave function. Recall that normalization just means that we insist if this wave function is going to be measuring probability, that the probability that the particle be somewhere, in this case somewhere inside the box, is 100% or unity. We can't have it be less than that. We can't have it be more than that. So let's go ahead and normalize 
the, the uh, particle in a box, energy eigenfunctions. Let's, we'll, we'll do the ground state, but it's the same for the others. And this will be practice problem nine. Um, this is a simple uh, calculus problem. However, before you do any kind of integration, what you should check is whether you can do anything to the integrand to make the integration easier. And we certainly can, because the easiest function to integrate or differentiate is the exponential function. And if we can cast our problem in terms of that, then we're out of the woods. If we use some other function where we have to play around a lot or we don't know the antiderivative, then that could be problematic. Now, oh, here's what we need to have. The integral from minus infinity to infinity of psi star psi is 1. But the wave function is 0 outside the box. And so in this case, what we can do is simplify the integral to the integral from 0 to L, because that's the only, it's 0 otherwise, psi star psi is equal to 1. And in terms of our unnormalized psi, what we have is the integral, remember if we have an i, we have to put it to minus i, so we have minus 2ia sine n pi x upon L times 2ia n pi x upon L minus i times i is plus 1, of course, that's why we always take the complex conjugate to make sure that we get a real positive probability. A doesn't depend on x, and therefore we can pull it out of the integral, and we get 4a squared times the integral from 0 to L of sine squared n pi x upon L. And we want that to be 1. And once we find out what the value of the integral is, we can work out what a is. And then we can go ahead and put a into our formula for the particle in a box wave function. And then we're done with the whole nine yards. Now you could look up the integral in a book. That's what I used to do when I was a student often if I couldn't do the integral. You could use software like Mathematica or MathCat or something else, Maple, or uh, you could look it up on integrals.com. But just for an exercise here, I want to do the problem, just do it right through, and I want to do it by changing the sign to back to e to the i theta. Because whenever I'm going to do a derivative or an integral, I think maybe if I turn it back to the exponential, it's just going to be much easier for me to do it. And the only formula I need here is that the integral of e to the ax dx is equal to 1 over a times e to the ax plus some constant. But if we're doing a definite integral, the constant is going to go away. It sub subtracts out when we take the two limits, of course. And that's all I need to know. And the only thing I need to know about complex numbers is Complex numbers behave the same way as real numbers. Uh, if we have e to the some funny complex thing, it's the funny complex thing in the denominator, and e to the funny complex thing again. And you just close your eyes and keep going. Well, let's have a look. We can write our normalization condition like this, rather than the 2i sine. We use e to the, I, e to the plus i e to the minus i, and then the same thing, e to the plus i, e to the minus i, times the integral, and that's equal to 1. And that simplifies to this, then. We end up with a squared times the integral from 0 to l of 1 minus e to the, uh, minus e to the i, minus e to the i plus 1, and that should be equal to 1. Now, the complex exponential, since it's equal to cos theta plus i sine theta, if you square it, and you have the square in the uh, formula there, then e to the 2i pi is equal to 1. And therefore, that part goes away, 
when we evaluate it at zero and L, both conditions, it goes away because of the way the wavelength of the wave function is set. And so we end up with three terms here, which I've written out, that should be equal to 1 a squared, and then 2x is the uh, antiderivative of 2, evaluated at L and at 0. That part has, has to work out. And then the other two parts that have a 1 over minus 2ia, because that was in the uh, complex exponential here, where I've let uh, a just be the collection uh, of constants, p and h bar and so forth. Um, and then another term. And the ones with the 2i in the denominator, fortunately for us, we don't have to worry about because when we evaluate it, it's 1 at L and it's 1 at 0. And so when we subtract those limits, that part just vanishes from the equation. And we're only left with the first term, which is 2L minus 0, or 2 times 0. And therefore, a squared times that should be equal to 1. So finally, at the end of the day, we find out that capital A is equal to 1 over um, uh, 2 times the square, the square root of 2L. So here's our final uh, wave function. Uh, psi n of x is 2i a, and that brings the 2 from the bottom to the top, and so uh, times sine n pi x over L, and that's equal to i times the square root of 2 upon L, sine n pi x over L. That would be our final result, except we still have a bias. We don't like the i. It still bugs people. We've got an imaginary wave function. It doesn't change the probability distribution. It does not change the energy. It does not change anything to multiply a wave function by a number that's complex that has unit length. What you should think about if you're multiplying a wave function by a complex number with unit length is something like you're changing the color of it, but you aren't changing the shape of it. And since when you take the complex conjugate, you get the opposite color, when you crash them together, you always get the same thing. And for that reason, at this point, we can get rid of the i, and that's conventional. And that's called picking the phase of the wave function. We're free to choose the phase to be whatever we like. We don't have to have an i. We can have a 1. We could have a minus i. It doesn't matter. But just to make it a little bit easier to understand if you're first encountering it, the conventional choice is to choose the phase to just be 1. And when you pick that phase, you get the final solution here. Psi n of x is equal to the square root of 2 over L times sine n pi x over L. The lowest energy state for the particle is n equals 1, because remember, we can't have n equals 0, or the wave function vanishes everywhere, and there's nothing anywhere. There's no particle. And there's a node at each side of the box, but nowhere else. So here's a plot of what the ground state wave function looks like. It's just half a sine wave. It comes up, reaches an apex in the center of the box, which is apparently the most likely place to be, and then goes down toward the edge of the box. And what we see is that even though there's no potential at all in the box, the fact that there is a potential setting limits um, really profoundly changes what the wave function does. It makes it far less likely that it's going to be near the edge of the box. It's as if the wave function no has a sixth sense and knows, hey, I don't want to get too close to the box because the energy out outside the box is infinite. So sort of like putting your hand on a wall and detecting that there's fire in the next apartment over and then you decide to stay away from the wall. And that's pretty much what the wave function's doing here. 
And remember, what we're plotting here is the probability amplitude. We have to take this thing that we've got and square it in order to figure out the probability density. And when we do that, we find that the edges are really very low because they were going up like x, so now they're x squared. That's even much smaller. Comes up and then sort of peaked in the middle and comes down again toward the other edge. Uh, it's, so let, let me uh, now take this wave function. We have an explicit value uh, for the expect, uh, we have an explicit form for the wave function. Let's figure out then the expectation value for the position and the momentum of the particle in this ground energy eigenstate. We know it's not in a position eigenstate because a position eigenstate means there's one position and this has a range of positions. It is in a momentum eigenstate uh, but it's a superposition of two possible values of p. Um, so it's not actually in a momentum eigenstate. It's in a superposition of two equal and opposite momentum eigenstates. Let's then go ahead and take this and just work through as an exercise in um, expectation values. Um, we're going to have to do some challenging integrals because we always have to do the integral to do the expectation value. And in addition, we're going to have to do some derivatives, so it seems like we're going forward and backward because remember the momentum operator is the derivative times ih bar and therefore we're going to have to do both. So recall, here's our formula for the expectation value of any operator. The expectation value of some operator omega is equal to the integral of psi omega hat operating on psi dx. For our finite box and for the position operator, we then have the following thing. The expectation value of position, the average value after a large number of measurements, is equal to the integral from 0 to L of square root of 2 upon L sine pi x upon, upon L times x because remember um, the x hat operator just multiplies by x the number, the, the variable. So the hat goes away. We just have x. Then we have the other one. Since they're both real, psi and psi star are the same. And we can do that integral easily and the expectation value comes out to L over 2, which is perfect. The, most, the, the average of all the possible measurements of the box averages to the middle. Well, it would have to, because the box has symmetry. How could it be anywhere else? But at least it's interesting that the math just tells us what we already knew. How about the momentum operator? This is a little bit harder, so let's work through this. The expectation value of p is equal to the integral of psi star p hat psi dx. And now uh, we have the derivative function in here and an integral. And if we clock through it, we have to take the derivative of sine uh, pi x upon L. And that gives us a cosine. And then that also brings out um, uh, 1 over L. So we, uh, we end up with, in the end, minus 2 i h bar times the integral from 0 to L of sine times some extra stuff times cosine. And this isn't so easy to figure out, but it turns out that we could rearrange it. Um, keep in mind, however, that the integral has a sine and a cosine in it. It doesn't have anything else. It doesn't have any imaginary parts. And we know, because the momentum operator is a Hermitian operator, that the expectation value has to be real. And we have a big I out in front. And the only way I times something can be real is if the something is zero. None of the other things 
L and so forth have any imaginary part. And therefore, we could just use that argument to say that the expectation value of the momentum is zero. And that would make perfect sense because the particle is not on average going anywhere. It's trapped in a box, so how could it have anything except the expectation value of the momentum be zero? Um, the, uh, now, as a further illustration, let's go forward and calculate the values of x squared and p squared. You'll see in a minute why we're bothering to do that. Um, the expectation value of x squared is the same thing. We have the integral again, and now we have the integral from 0 to L of x squared sine squared pi x upon L dx. And we have a 2 over L out in front. And again, you can either do this by parts, you can do this by software, you can look it up, and what you find is that the expectation value of x squared, the square of the position, comes out to be L squared over 3 minus L squared over 2 times pi squared. That's what the integral works out. You can probably see that the first part, the L squared over 3, comes from integrating x squared times 1, and the other part comes from integrating the trig functions a couple of times. So that tells you pretty much how that's coming about. So that's the expectation value of the square of the position. That's not in the middle, and it's certainly not zero. For the expectation value of p squared, we have to take two derivatives and then do the integral. We have minus ih bar, the derivative, minus ih bar, the derivative. So we take the derivative once, the sine goes to the cosine. We take the derivative again, the cosine goes to minus the sine. Conveniently, canceling out the minus i times minus i, which is minus, because i times minus i is plus 1, so minus i times minus i is minus 1. That all goes away. And of course, we expect the expectation value of something squared to be positive. If it came out to be negative or something else, we would be have an uh, indication that we've made a mistake in the algebra. And therefore, the expectation value of p squared turns out to be uh, h squared n squared. Uh, over L squared. Now we can uh, combine these two then in some interesting little exercise. Why would this be interesting? And the answer is we had the uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle applies to any wave function. If we measure the position of momentum, the uncertainty in them has to satisfy bigger than or equal to h bar of over 2. And now we can figure out what that is. And in doing so, we can really expand on what this delta x, delta p means. Let's think of the variance, which is the deviation from the mean squared of the measurement. The expectation value of the variance is the expectation value of x minus the expectation value of x, all uh, squared. So the expectation value of that. Well, if I write out x minus the expectation value of x, keep in mind x is a variable here, and x expectation value of x is just a number. And when we work it out, then, if we work it out, we get the expectation value of x squared minus 2x times the expectation value of x plus the expectation value of x squared. The expectation value of 2x times the expectation value of x is just 2 times the expectation value of x because the expectation value of the expectation value is just what you expect. It's just the expectation value of x. And therefore, the uh, second term subtracts from the last term, and we get 
that the variance is equal to the expectation value of x squared minus the expectation value of x squared. And the same thing applies for the momentum. The variance in the momentum is the expectation value of the momentum squared minus the expectation value of the momentum squared. If the distribution is very narrow, if they're in fact they all have the same momentum, then the expectation value of the square is equal to the square of the expectation value and the variance is zero. And same thing for position. If there's no spread in position, then the variance is zero. That just means that it's a very, very, very narrow distribution. You could have an exam where every student gets the mean. It would have no variance at all, and that would be very hard then to make a curve for that class. The variance in position, while well, we knew the expectation value was L over 2, so we're going to subtract that squared, and we worked out the expectation value of x squared by doing that uh, somewhat nasty integral. That was L squared over 3 minus L squared over 2 pi squared. And that works out with a little bit of algebra to be L squared times 1 12th minus 1 over 2 pi squared. This doesn't look too encouraging because usually things are a little bit neater than that, but um, that's another good reason to do this problem because things aren't always so neat as they might be in, in some setup problem. The variance in the momentum, well, the expectation value of the momentum was zero, so that's easy. So the, expect, the variance in the momentum is just the expectation value of p squared. And we got that uh, uh, worked out, a squared pi squared over l squared, as you can see. And therefore, if we associate the uncertainty in position and momentum with the square root of the variance, so the variance has the unit of square length and square momentum. If we take the square root of that, we get a measure of the width of the distribution. And for the uncertainty in position, that then becomes L, has to do with the box. The bigger the box is, the bigger delta x is. Well, that makes sense because the particle can spread out if the box is big. It goes linearly in L times the square root of our 1 12th minus 1 over 2 pi squared, whatever that is. And for the momentum, we take the square root and uh, we get the formula shown. Now, we had a relationship, the uncertainty principle that said delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Let's have a look. If we take delta h delta p, we get um, the following formula. And the key here is that when we simplify it and pull out the pi to get rid of the pi, then we get the uh, uh, following thing. We have pi squared minus 6 in there times 1 third in the square root. So we got our h bar over 2, and then we've got square root of 1 third times pi squared minus 6. And pi squared is, I don't know what it is, but it's bigger than 3 squared, because I do know that pi is bigger than 3. So that thing there, whatever it is, is, is bigger than h bar over 2 times 1 third times 3 squared minus 6 rather than pi squared minus 6. And that is uh, just h bar over 2. And so what we've shown is that for a particle in a box, the uncertainty is bigger than the minimum uncertainty. Now Heisenberg did never say that the uncertainty in position times momentum can be, should be equal to the minimum. In fact, that's rare. Usually, you can't even do as well as that. But what he did say is that you can never be less than the minimum. And thank goodness, when we work it out, it doesn't depend on the length of the box, the uncertainty principle. 
because as the box gets longer, then the momentum becomes narrower as the position gets wider. And therefore, what we've shown here in kind of this simple calculation, which did take a little bit of time, but nevertheless, it's not it's fairly straightforward, is that for the ground state particle in a box, that we satisfy the uncertainty principle. In fact, we're about um, at least 10 percent too big compared to the absolute minimum that we could uh, have. And if we did the same calculation for the n equals 2, n equals 3, whatever states, it would be the same conclusion exactly is that we would satisfy the uncertainty principle for all those states. And if you want to challenge, go ahead and try for something other than the ground state to calculate delta p delta x the same way we did, but just substitute in your new formula and convince yourself that it always satisfies the uncertainty principle. The uh, energy of the particle increases like n squared, and the wave function has more nodes for higher energy. And what you, what you often see in books is sort of a composite plot. And these composite plots can be confusing when you first encounter them. Because in actual fact, what we're doing is plotting two things at once. We usually plot a flat line like a ladder to indicate this energy, the particle can be at this energy. And we'd have these things going up like n squared. And then, to give you an idea of what the wave function of the particle looks like, we plot the wave function of the particle on the line as if the line were zero, even though we're moving the line up in energy. And you have to get used to these plots because if you, if you think of them in terms of energy or I'm plotting something wavy here that's going up and down in energy, you're missing the whole point. The energy is given by the line, and then separately, we're just plotting the wave function to see what it looks like. It doesn't have units of energy, and we just plot it on the same um, graph because we're lazy, and somebody did that early on, and, and uh, everybody liked it once they got used to it. But when you first encounter these kind of plots, they can be very confusing. You just don't, finally, you don't know what's being plotted. Here's a typical plot, then, that you might see in a book. I've just taken the energy scaled as n squared. The first energy level is uh, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. And then, on those energy levels, treating them basically as the 0, I've plotted the first wave function, which I've called psi 1. That's the ground state. and then the next one, which has one node in the middle, so that one avoids being in the middle. The bottom one likes being in the middle. The next one up avoids being in the middle. And then the third one, psi 3, which has two nodes in the interior of the box. And that one likes being in the middle again and likes being closer to the edges of the box. And if you take very, very, very high levels of n, then you'll find that you just get these little ripples everywhere. And basically, the probability of being anywhere is basically um, the same. There are, there's little things like an egg carton, but those things are so tiny, tinier than the width of a, a nucleon in an atom, that there is no way we can do any experiment to try to uncover uh, that kind of corrugation in the wave function. Okay, I want to uh, close there and ask the following question, uh, which we'll get to in the next lecture, and that has to do with a phenomenon called tunneling. We made the potential go to infinity at the edge of the box, and the reason we did that is you're going to see what happens if we don't do that, which is that we get set a lot of math problems to do, and not all of them are easy. But what would happen if, instead of being infinite, it, the edges just rose up to some finite uh, value instead? 
what would happen if we had uh, a plot where we have the potential be higher than the energy of the particle. So classically, the particle is trapped and has to remain within the wall forever. But it doesn't go to infinity. And therefore, we can't use the argument that psi should necessarily vanish completely. Because if a small part of psi leaks through, and that adds a high energy from the potential being so high, that doesn't necessarily mean that all bets are off. Because by spreading out more, psi has had not so much curvature. So it could be that it kind of relaxes out and pushes out, slips out a little bit, and that's a better situation than having it cut off just because um, of the edge of the box. And in fact, what we're going to find next time is that because of this wave nature, is that the, the wave function always sneaks in to some forbidden region. It's sort of like somebody at 4 a.m rolling through the stop sign when nobody else is around. And uh, so it's very interesting, in fact, that there's a big difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, because in quantum mechanics, there's always some chance of escaping out of jail, no matter how tight the bars are. And eventually, in things like radioactive decay, for example, that's exactly what happens. So we'll pick up quantum tunneling in the next in the next lecture